Hi, Jim. Hi, Tina. We are on time, right? I think it's right now, yeah. <clears throat> I got here a couple of minutes early. Oh, oh, yeah. But the other people just have the Italian delay. <clears throat> yeah, we're probably just a little bit late. Yeah, I I you know there is a uh, Ada West TED Talk still going on, not finishing yet. Ah, okay. It's just me. Hello, good morning, Tina. Hey, morning, Wednesday, morning, everyone. Good morning, or Good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Good morning, Greg. Hey, Greg. I'm just waiting a few minutes to see if Ned shows up. Hey, Ned. Welcome. Glad you're here today. Hey, how are you? Good. You're at least half the show today, so. Maybe give it one more minute, then we'll kick it off. All right, let's get going. Time goes quickly. Um, so I believe today we have two topics on the agenda. One is for uh, Ned to complete the presentation discussion on co-room for attestation results. And the second is discussion about um, 2024 objectives for um, this SIG. And um, so unless somebody else has something else they wanted to inject for today, um, I, I think we should just get that going. And I would 
to me, it seems uh, makes sense to let Ned finish since he was uh, talking last week, and um, and then thirty minutes in or so, if it's still ongoing, then I'll I'll call time on that and we can uh, jump over to the twenty twenty four objective discussion. That makes sense to folks. Or if anybody thinks we shouldn't do it that way, let me know. All right, Ned, would you like to? Okay, yeah, I'm trying to remember where I left off. Let me share. Uh, hang on a second. Yeah, it, it probably, I, I know it's it's paged out of my head and I looked for a doc and I looked for a recording. I couldn't find either this morning. So I was not able to page into my head where we stood last time. So certainly for me, a three minute refresher and on what we discussed last time. Okay, I can maybe do lap rules on slides. Oh, that's sharing to the wrong screen. Uh, let me try see if this works. Hang on. It does look like there's a recording posted. I know we had a, a problem in the past where they kind of fell off, but uh, it looks like the meeting of October 24th is out there and I'll grab the link for the playlist here. So let's... Uh, uh, but we're looking for a recording from November 21st, right? Or is it November 7th? But All right. the, I, didn't see, I didn't see any in November. I'm pretty sure the last meeting was in November. <laughs> Um, Actually, the last one, yeah, the last meeting was November 21st, and I didn't see that recording. No, you are right. My eyes drifted down in the uh, agenda minutes to the yeah. 21st. So, all right. Let me see what I can do in the background. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. So, uh, what is Zoom doing here? I, I saw your slides for a moment and then they disappeared. I'm just having problems with monitors. It's going to the wrong monitor. So hang on. How's that? Yeah, I see it. Thanks. All right. Um, Okay, so this is kind of right in the middle. Do we want to go back? I'm trying to think. So we started out, I'm just going to do real quick. So we started out here saying, hey, there's this thing called CoRIM schema that's out there. And there's, um, you know, work being done to define evidence that aligns with the schema. And that's supposed to help the verifier. <clears throat> do its job so it, it does it minimizes the amount of sort of schema mappings that have to be done in order to get into a consistent internal representation uh, and then it's saying hey i've got this schema that's out there and i have an internal representation then is it meaningful or does it make sense to continue to leverage that schema when talking about attestation results that's the basic question and then it then we said hey there's a way to describe devices of all kinds as a composition of stuff and that there's sort of this uh, composition of potential attestation results, you know, for each of the subcomponents, you could sort of say, hey, I could have an attestation result that's described in terms of the various subcomponents. So there's no really reason why an attestation result should should lose the granularity of the of the richness of the composition that sort of is in, is uh, as part of the the schema that the verifier has to deal with. I used this example that said, "Hey, there's actually multiple ways in order to look at the composition. There's there's sort of the bottom up composition which you get from following sort of a boot path, <clears throat> but you also have top down composition which you get maybe from say an OEM that's putting a system together of different components." And it's 
it's meaningful to have both in a in um, as a represent as as a representation of the attester in in some schema, right? Then we talked about assumptions about appraisal, just basically the rules for how appraisal works. We talked about attestation results in terms of a design, um, <clears throat> where the you know it's saying what's involved in. If you were to if you were to leverage the CoRAM schema, what would be involved in doing that? And so, kind of at the top level, it's hey, I can I can create another tag type in CoRAM that is of type attestation result. Uh, and then we said, you know, well, let's take a look at the at this the CAR schema at a sort of uh, at a top level. And it basically mirrors the the ear schema, with some but with some tweaks. And then we said, um, drilling down into that, what are what's kind of the model for in in CoRAM? What's the model for representing information? And it's basically this idea of a logical triple. And so you can. Uh, have an attestation results triple structure <clears throat> that essentially leverages what's already there in the schema. So you can have endorsed, and, and in particular, the endorsement triple seems to be an appropriate structure that kind of would describe everything that you would find in an attestation res in an attestation result, um, or at least in you know in, in terms of the internal state of the of the verifier once it's done with its appraisals. Uh, there's some structures for doing um, trust dependency and for doing composition. So this is the dependency triple and membership triple. Um, and we didn't talk much about COSWID, but the schema supports COSWID as well. And then I think we talked about explanation of the CAR schema claims. Uh, so what's actually inside and this again, the structure maps closely what's in ear, but it's this, it's mapping it to the CoRAM schema where there is a, you know, within the schema, there's sort of this, um, you know, name value structure where you have a set of claims that identify or name the, the component. And then you have a set of measurements that are, you know, the claims that apply to the component. And so that's called the latter part is called measurement values map. And so this is just saying, hey, everything that we think about that a verifier might assert about, you know, in terms of a result is essentially just another set of claims. And those can be expressed as as a set of measurements uh, that are, that are, that fit into the same schema. So it's just essentially extending the measurement values map with claims that are sort of in the category of attestation results, things like AR4SI, trust tier and trustworthiness vector, et cetera. Uh, and then, and this is where I think we can't remember how far we got, um, but I don't think we got to the verifier stages section. Someone can remind me if we did. I, I don't personally recall. Okay, so maybe I'll slow down and go through the verifier stages a little bit more carefully. <clears throat> All right, so so the next couple of slides are just here are there to sort of help us appreciate what's going on inside of a verifier. And uh, so the verifier is going to have a set of stages. There's a stage zero that I didn't mention, which is the, you know, check all the signatures of all the stuff that's incoming, right? So the verifier has multiple inputs, evidence, endorsement, reference values, policy, and, and even, you know, some, some input from the relying party telling it sort of how, you know, what it's interested, what, what kind of results is it interested in. So all of those inputs have to be verified, you know, cryptographically, and so I, I just skipped over that. That's stage zero. Once that's all been, you know, 
done, then then there's the it's the then there's the set of stages of what does the verifier do in in terms of its internal function in order to arrive at a, conclu a, a an appraisal conclusion. And so, um, if you if you sort of um, you know line things up, essentially the first thing the the, the thing that is may be helpful is this acronym called ACS that refers to accepted claim set, which is just saying the, ver the verifier is going to keep track of what it thinks are the state of the attester. And uh, so, so uh, the IETF is, is form formulating some terminology, which maybe is helpful, where the attester is essentially uh, uh, the entity has it. There's a set of you know states that we think of as its actual state, uh, and then there's a set of references, reference values that is its possible state. I think they're using the term reference state, uh, um, but it's it's sort of hey the an attester could have uh, di different different attesters in deployment could have different uh, actual state. But they're all within the scope of of the acceptable possible state. So you know m maybe device one is running version one of some firmware, and device two is running version two of some firmware. Both of them are are you know by, uh, considered acceptable by the manufacturer. Uh, but at any given instance, a an attester has you know one state, one you know one actual state, and so the Verifier is trying to determine well what is the actual state of the attester that I'm currently talking to right now, and ACS is just the term we use for describing what the actual actual state is. Okay, and stage one is essentially saying, okay, I'm talking to a particular attester. You give me your evidence. There's a bunch of claims. It's describing some state, and you accept it uh, under the key of the attester that says, yep, the attester says he's in this state. That's good. Um, I accept that. Stage two is then to say, is there are there reference values from supply chain that corroborate that accepted state that's in evidence? And if so, keep track of that. And so the re reference values is going to say, well, I'm asserting you know essentially the same claims that are in evidence, but it's coming under my authority as the as the re reference value provider. And and so if that's the case, then you know keep track of the keep track of the the fact that as the reference value provider, I you know underwrite the the uh, the evidence assertions. Okay, and and as we'll see below at step five, the assumption is is that there's a policy that says that the relying party accepts the authority of the re reference value provider at higher you know, veracity than the authority of just the naked um, attester key. Okay. <clears throat> so stage three then says, hey, there's there are other endorsement, you know, endorsers in the supply chain and the ecosystem that have additional, uh, that want to make additional assertions about the actual state of the attester, and we refer to those as endorsements. And the, the main difference is is that the verifier accepts the endorsement claims because they're asserted by the endorser, uh, uh, even though there isn't any evidence that that to corroborate it against. So it isn't it isn't the case that we're trying to just match something that the attester already said. Or there's some, the, you know, the endorser is saying, "Hey, I, I, I'm the authority, and I'm asserting that these claims about the attester are true." And this could be something like, "Hey, this I know this device achieved common criteria, you know, level four, or it's FIP certified, <clears throat> uh, yeah. or you know, I, I manufactured it to have no debug states, uh, etc." Yeah, doesn't there have to be some? some tie, some reference tie, right? You can't just have an endorsement that says, you know, that says, uh, you know, bug-free code. They're, they're, and then it just, yeah. if it magically appears in the verifier, it says, oh, well, whatever I have here is bug-free code. It has to be some yeah. tie-in, right? Was, uh, there has, yeah, there has to be some way to name the attester. So typically the attester is named by 
a device identity and the claim is asserted based on its device identity. So for example, you could have a, a device identity certificate that has some extensions that says, hey, this mm -hmm. this uh, device was you know certified. Mm -hmm. So I think okay. I'm, I'm, I'm still not totally clear on reference values versus endorsements, but I think what I'm detecting here in this discussion is a reference value might just say, you know, of the collection of 20 different string values you might see for some field, you know, these 10 are signed by this uh, reference value provider. And that's yeah. it. There's no need to match like a particular uh, instance of, of an attested, of an attester. It's just like, this reference value provider, you know, signed, you know, the string foobar. Yeah. And that's right. It, so, know. Yeah. So you can, there's okay. sort of class, the, there's sort of class and instance, right? You can have class mm -hmm. claims, which is typically what evidence and reference is describing, and then instance claims, which is typically okay. what endorsements are trying to describe. Um, Got it. Although there, that, there, there are examples for class endorsements as well, but it's, it's all in how, what the criteria is for match for for a, how you're going to apply those claims to the attester it's like what what name are you giving to the attester in order to apply apply the claims and the tester can be known by its instance name or by its class name so mm -hmm. that is a simple way to describe it okay <clears throat> so stage Thanks. three is saying hey there's a set of of endorsements that apply to the apply to the construction of the a tester that is sort of the top-down view. It says, "Hey, you know, there's there's a motherboard and there's a chassis and there's some NICs and some CPUs, etc." Um, stage four, which is focusing on conditional endorsement, which is probably the more the normal case, which is to say, there's some condition criteria that has to be met before the and the endorsed claims are applied. And the condition might be, "Hey, if this if there's some set of evidence that matches and some set of other endorsements that match, then apply these these additional endorsements, right? And so the con the condition is sort of like a query that's a query of the ACS that says, hey, if the ACS is in this state, then these claims apply. If it's not in that state, then don't apply these claims, these endorsement claims, right? So stage four, it's like you can have, if stage four came earlier, then it wouldn't make sense because the condition wouldn't be met or might not be met, right? So it's like, that's sort of, it's sort of, this is sort of why it, you do the evidence first, then the reference, then direct endorsement, then conditional endorsement, right? Because you go, you can, the richness of the condition determines the order in a sense. Or, or is it also saying that the conditional endorsement can refer, refer to, yeah, outputs of stage two and three to. Yeah, that would be a correct, uh, another way to say that. Yeah. Okay. So the the, the full point is the ACS is keeping track of state as we go through the stages, and so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but those words might be better. <clears throat> stage five then is saying I'm going to apply appraisal policy, and appraisal policy has the effect of trimming down the claims. So if you think about stages one through four, this is a it's sort of accreting state, it's growing, right? The, the, the tree of claims has been growing this whole time. And then you get to policy and a policy, policies then have the, uh, you know, describe how, what to throw away. In other words, I don't trust, um, you know, this, this uh, supply chain entity for anything. So if they had sort of asserted something along the way, throw it away, because I don't trust them. Or it could say, hey, I've discovered that version one of, you know, X uh, firmware is, is, is bad, even though they haven't, even though the vendor says it's good, I'm saying it's bad. I did my own testing and I think it's bad. So I'm going to start a policy that says throw away version one of something. Okay. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the role of appraisal policy. And then stage six is then assessing the ACS and adding whatever the verifier wants to assert as claims. So it's it's the it's the the fit the, the you know the the final stage of appraisal when the verifier says, hey, I've determined that that this you know tr trust tier or trust vector is appropriate for a particular component, uh, or it might say based on all of the trust 
uh, tiers for all of the components, I have a, an overall top level trust tier that I want to assert, right? So any, any of those kinds of use cases would be applied in stage six. Is, is there a reason why that's described as ad hoc versus something like a conditional endorsement? Because it seems like in many or perhaps all cases that could be done with the techniques in two, three, four, or- So what are you referring to? You said Stage six. So stage, stage six to me sounds ad like stage two, three, and four are talking about reference, you know, adding to adding claims to ACS based on reference values, direct endorsements, conditional endorsements. Stage six says now, I think it says we're going to add something, you know, some additional claims to ACS. And it's so not saying could, mechanically. Yeah, how you could you, you could we could reword stage six using kind of the wording of stage four where the verifier is defining the like the condition and if those conditions are met then it's going to assert verifier claims yeah. i'm i'm, I'm trying to tease out my of... i'm trying to tease out in my mind is there something we know about how this has to work to say that we can't use the tools that we use for let's just say stage 4 which i think yeah, is essentially yeah. using the corim tools to basically you know match some criteria and then you know yeah uh, add add some claim, you know, some some claim or claims yeah. plural. You know, could, why yeah. couldn't that yes. change? Okay. Stage stage six could use the algorithms that implement stage four. Okay. But it's just the the it's the verifier. You know, it's the verifier who's asserting them as opposed to yeah. the endorser. Right. So conceptually, but, the yeah. ver. It, okay. Okay. I think you you yeah. asked my question. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. So. The next couple of slides are just examples to give you just some appreciation of kind of what's in the ACS. And I don't know if we want to belabor this. It, I'll go through it if it's helpful, but this is kind of <clears throat> kind of a um, high level notation of some uh, of, of our example use case where you can sort of see, you know, the chassis, the board, the card, and and then the different uh, claim sets that are asserted, the green boxes are essentially the what's in the different triples structures. And it's just showing showing how this information gets built up over time. I have a separate slide deck that goes that starts at, you know, goes through a whole bunch of use cases and it populates this uh, ACS little by little as you go through all the use cases and builds everything up. So this is sort of a showing you the the end result view as opposed to the going through each step. Um, but the, the basic sort of observation is that the information in the ACS by and large repre is representable using like the endorsement triple structure, although there are some 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 differences in terms of cardinality. So I, I may have cases where I have multiple authorities that are asserting the same claims. I have, may have cases where, um, you know, different claims are asserted under different authority, and I need to keep track of of all of that. Um, but otherwise, it's pretty close. Then this slide is saying, okay, <clears throat> when the verifier does its does its thing, it's going to be asserting some additional claims. We've sort of already mentioned this, but this is just showing you in, in the context of the ACS what that might look like. And so on the previous previous slide, they're all the green uh, um, EMTs, which stands for environment measurement uh, tuple. Those are, those are sort of compacted here in this slide um, uh, with these green boxes, you know, existing EMTs. And then the new ones, which are attestation results that are, you know, claims that are asserted by the verifier are called attestation result claims. And, and it's just saying, hey, I can, I can add them, easily add them into the existing structure that's within the ACS at the right level of abstraction. And so, and then there's this new one. Oh, sorry about that. There's this new one, which has global scope, which is to say, I, the the verifier could assert a claim that says, "Hey, after looking at all of the attestation results of all of the components, the overall trustworthiness value is reduced to a boolean of trusted or not trusted," and and that's also a claim that could be asserted. 
maybe it with global scope at the top level. Or maybe it's, you know, common criteria, or maybe it's FIPS. I don't know. Right. It's but but that's the general the kind of that's the the hand wavy big picture of of uh where this is trying to go. So, so here's is uh, is that last slide what you intend to provide to is what's provided to the relying party or so that's uh, the question is... right yeah so okay. so here's the here's kind of the the final state right it's like mm -hmm. okay here's everything i've trimmed out the, the garbage and i have all of the stuff that the verifier is saying and then the question is well what how does this apply right what what did the relying party want and so i've tried to capture different scenarios for for what constitutes a relying party and so it could be the case that the relying party wants a bunch of different formats or it wants one of a bunch of different possible formats in which case there's this mapping from whatever is the internal state that's represented in the acs to some external you know format maybe it's you know a token it's jwt maybe it's x509 xml who knows so so there's some sort of hey there's a the the verifier becomes the common oracle for mapping to different formats and and so there and so there's a format mapping but there's also a schema mapping that says what's re represented in the acs schema um if it's a non lossy translation then then the other format the schema behind the other format also also has to be the same schema Otherwise, it turns into a, law, a lossy mapping. But it helps to be able to say, here is the ACS, here's the oracle that, that we all agree is represents the state that, that is the result of the verifier. I, th I think one of the thing, right? I think one of the points brought up last time was that for many relying parties, like let's say so if you go back to your previous slide where you had a bunch of supporting data, then eventually there was one top level king is trusted. So Trust yeah. it is true. So for a set of relying parties, that may be the only thing they're interested in. And Correct. so is it possible in what you're thinking about here for, you know, once this gets translated into whatever format they use, X509, CWT, JDWT, for that to be the only part of the schema that comes through. So they are not, you know, having so the, the, the token. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So that would make that that makes the schema translation step really simple because you just have to represent a boolean in any of these other formats but where's that, where that captured where's where's that and where in this structure is you know for line party one where, where's that bit of knowledge captured okay. that says when you translate for this so, relying party or for all relying parties just yeah push that one value up um so that was in the policies and i didn't re really represent that um but we do have in in one of the previous slides in the structure, there was a claim that was a policy claim. Mm -hmm. Right here, is this it? Yeah, policy ID. Mm -hmm. Right. So one of the claims would be I applied, you know, miss I replied policy, um, you know, number four, Mister Relying Party, which is your policy, which is telling me that you only care about this claim, the the boolean mm -hmm. trusted. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm telling you. So I'm going to give you back at least two claims. One is, here's the answer, and here's the policy that you gave me that said that you wanted this answer. Mm -hmm. okay. let, 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 me, let me try a, a, a related question. So okay. is it possible, so there's, a, there's an element of this that seems to be about using CoRIM as you know a very common structure to drive a lot of the logic in a verifier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then there's this last, this tail end step where there's some flexibility to produce, you know, um, attestation results in a format that's most useful for relying party. So okay. is it possible, for example, to produce, um, uh, I, I think of ear as a particular, and maybe I'm, I'm a bit wrong here, but I think of it as a, as an eat profile for attestation results for uh, sec secure interaction or AR, AR4SI. Um, is it possible for what you're thinking of here to produce ear, you know, in, yeah. a, in a JWT or CWT? Yeah. More or less, so, the CoRIM stuff gets hidden from the relying party. It doesn't see triplets. It just right. sees. Yeah. Right. 
so you get so this so here the common oracle could do that mapping from car to ear that would be fine car, mm -hmm. car would be a superset of of ear essentially mm -hmm. okay so the mapping can happen all right okay but there are other Wait, use cases sorry, sorry to interrupt Ned, but this is you know logically what we do in verizon right we keep an internal state the acs is internally yeah, yeah. Some way, right? And then we serialize yeah. the air. We could serialize the car if we wanted to. <laughs> yeah, you could I, you could serialize car directly or not. I mean, you know. I think every verifier has its internal state, and then at the end has to you know map to <laughs> produce some sort of specific format. Right. Um, right. So I'm just the, saying, the, let's let's not let's so understand the, kind of you know what the state is. And, then, and then that's why I'm using ACS here. <clears throat> but I can also, I also need to serialize the ACS if you go to this diagram onto the right, which is, let's say I have a mesh of verifiers and I've got partial ACS information from verifier A that's feeding a verifier B and C and D, right? I don't want to throw anything away, which is what I'm doing with the common Oracle case. I'm probably throwing stuff away. But here, I don't want to throw anything away because I still don't know the final answer and I have to work with other verifiers. So I, I need some way to represent fully the ACS, but recognizing that it's partial. And and then, you know, um, and, and that may involve having some, some attestation results, but also carrying forward some evidence and or some reference values, or maybe there's some evidence or reference values that are injected at different stages in B and C. Um, so having a way to represent fully the ACS and and carry it to another entity um, seems to make sense. And then, of course, when you get to verifier D, you have the, the final ACS, and that becomes the oracle. So you kind of flip over to the other use case, right? So, so that's that's another aspect that maybe we need to think about. Uh, and then finally, just the whole notion of processing consistency and correctness, where you know, being able to say I've I've made the different state transitions um, correctly, it's, it's it's like can we get to some you know, we should be able to to describe the state transitions in a in a fundamental way that's that's provably correct. Um, so what what would be? I mean, I, now you know. Thanks for this presentation. I, I get it a million times better than I did previously. Um, what would what in your mind is the specific next steps or call to action for the community? Um, so I had this comparison slide, and then I have this conclusion, which is okay. kind of maybe the call to action. And it's really mm -hmm. it's just saying, hey, let's define ear claims as measurement values extensions, right? And that could have easily have said car claims. It's just, you know, they're almost interchangeable at this point. But it's just saying, let's leverage this existing schema to represent a, a result, um, you know, describe ear in the context of CoRIM schema so that it follows this sort of common pattern for the stages and for the, the state machine sort of transitions. Uh, and then and then all these, you know, all the other use cases here can will fall into place. Um, and we're, we're sure to, that we're not losing some, some state. We're not sort of introducing a, a um, a lossy mapping prematurely is kind of the main concern to, that I have. Right. To to me, the um, can you go to that last slide for a second? Yeah. yeah. The the so first maybe I've mis misunderstood, but in my mind, ear is like an e an e profile for AR four SI, and it's something that relying parties will look at, and there's nothing. For the way I understand relying party scenarios, you know, the flat claim structure in E, you know, it's like they, they're looking for, you know, they're looking for a particular uh, claim and a particular value to make a, a, an authorization decision, one or more of those kind of things. Um, mm -hmm. The measure, this seems like it's, so first, if ear is for relying parties, 
then is this measurement values map, which I assume is a triplet kind of thing, is this adding more complexity? You know, is adding more complexity for relying parties? No, it's so <clears throat> it's it, it, the, there's sort of a um, there's sort of a question of what's what does the relying part what information is most meaningful to the relying party in terms of offsetting risk because essentially data station is all about providing information to offset relying party risk and <clears throat> We could we could say, hey, the, all relying parties only ever need a boolean, and that uh, offsets risk. For uh, that offsets every form of risk, and I think that would be a naive statement. No, I think I'm saying something slightly right. different. In, okay. in my mind, the 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 simple model presented by E, which is relying parties thinks in terms of claim sets and values for the claims in the claim set. And this seems to be saying, oh, we're going to start, exp you know, the default is going to start exposing something more complicated. It's going to be this notion of a, of a claim and its value. All of a sudden, you have to start understanding triples to kind of get to that same, like, if I'm trying to say, you know, is the, if I had a claim previously, was this is trusted or claim previously as to, let's say, the cl cloud service provider was it Google or Microsoft. Now, somehow, that's going to have to be parsed out of some sort of triplet. It seems like it's, yeah, maybe I misunderstood, Stan, but if that's the case, it seems like it's making life more complex for relying parties. So let me go, I'm going to flip back to this other diagram. All right. So, am I remembering so, right, though, that it doesn't really specify oh, it's, granular it's, formats? That's it's, it's left it, to you the know, profile? It, Eat, eat, eat is a full, you know, ignoring submods, right? Eat is, you know, a, a set of claims, a collection of claims, although using the right terminology. But, um, and I primarily know that the JWT, the JSON stuff, for the JSON stuff, it's, you know, string for the claim name. And then the value can be any valid JSON. Now, you so you can have a, an object, a JSON object, and do anything you want, triplets, nested, blah, 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 anything that's expressible in JSON. But typically, the way that it's used is it's very simply like, you know, claim name, string, claim value, a simple type, like a number, a Boolean, a string, right? It doesn't, you know, typically get more complex than that, at least in the, the work that I've seen. Maybe um, in Verizon's case, it's, it's, that's not true. But in yeah. MAH <clears throat> case, that's, that's certainly true. So, so, so I'm going to flip back to the slide for a second and sort of talk about try to answer your question mm -hmm. in terms of complexity, okay? So let's say the, ver the relying party is to the right of the verifier and the relying party is, wants, to ha wants to have some complexity hidden because this is complex, right? This is a really simple example and it's complex. And so we can't expect relying parties to want to be able to process all of this complexity all the time. They want, they want complexity hiding. In some sense, the lead a tester in this case is is a way to hide some complexity, right? Because it's just going to say, you know, the system is described. You no, know, I'm describing the system based on you know, you know, these three stacks of stuff, but that's all under one appraisal context, which is mm -hmm. quote the attester. Okay, and so the verifier might say, well, that's a that's the level of granularity of complexity that my relying party customer cares about. And so I'm going to produce an answer that is specific to the lead a tester context. Or, or you could say the same thing about sort of the top down with the chassis. So I, I only care about the, the chat from the chat perspective of the a tester. It's this, it's the, everything inside of the chassis box, but I don't need to know everything inside the chassis box. I just need to know well, what was the answer for chassis. Okay. And that's information hiding. Now, there can be cases where you have the, the relying party says, actually, um, that's true. But I also need to know that in the a particular case where I need to know that my roots of trust are done a certain way. And so I, I, I don't need to know about all the intermediate stuff, but I need to know that this NIC2 root of trust, it's a, it has these particular properties. Okay. And so someone has to be able to sort of put that together if you've if you've 
if the schema has thrown things out prematurely, then I, you can't, you don't have the flexibility to, to apply, to de apply that level of, of, you know, information yeah. exposure yeah. Yeah. to the use, use case, right? And it's all use case specific. So I can't, I can't, honestly just rule it all out and say hey that will never happen i don't need the detail i don't need to i don't need to throw away the information because of information hiding i need to keep it um, Note that there's, 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 a, selectively there's a difference expose in, it. yeah there's there's a i'm not talking about any additional information that's in the resultant uh, token for the relying party for audit purposes and so on um, mm -hmm. If we go back to the if you go back to the slide where you showed the different stages, um, I, I think I may have another way of asking my question. So okay. I can see um, uh, that the scenario I'm thinking about, I think, is essentially the relying party. Let's say here's here's the scenario: relying party wants to know if you know the 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 attested and the, the attester is. Um, a confidential VM in Google Cloud or in Azure. And mm -hmm. so from this flows perspective, you know, that's probably something added by either an endorser, by an endorsement and step four, conditional endorsement. There's mm -hmm. there's some endorser that knows how to look at some measurements and say, you know, this is a Google Cloud VM or this is an Azure VM. Um, or in stage six, where's the verifier doing, you know, essentially something similar. Mm -hmm. So Everything you know that that is the only piece of information in this case that the relying party is it, it needs to know. You know, it's basically wants to make a decision: is this a Google Cloud cool? You know, <laughs> share my data if it's an Azure Cloud VM. No, don't, or vice versa. Okay. So, okay. in that case, are they going to be? Does this design, or where you're suggesting to go? Does this is this going to say you have to work with a triplet, or can they? You know, from the from the schema of their token, do they still get to basically say, you know, essentially token dot cloud provider dot name equals equals Google, you know, this equals equals Microsoft so, that. So is it is it clear that in each of these appraisal contexts that those six stages are applied for each context? Yeah. Okay. So so the question is going to be. Um, which which context which appraisal context is the right granularity for the stage six answer? Well, let's make it simple. Let's just say the verifier at the end does it. That lays the, the it's stage six for the verifier after everything's done. All the different all yeah. the different components are evaluated. Now it's doing the final yeah. thing. Yeah. And the question is. Does this does the relying party have to know how to parse uh, CoRIM schema stuff? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, essentially. Does does, so, does... But I think yeah. So I think what I'm trying to I think what I'm saying is <clears throat> there's no free lunch. The the complexity, whether it's represented in CoRIM schema or whether it's represented some other way, it's the same complexity, and if we say it has to be done in in eat token format then we're just saying whatever complexity is represented in corim has to be mapped into an eat profile that has the same complexity and someone has to go through and do the schema mapping it's just it's a database you know schema translation it's like trying to just define a yeah. um you know uh what do you call it a um, yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's your the Oracle thing you talked about, right? Uh, yeah, it's yeah. Just, there's there's that layer, and maybe maybe my my uh, I was poking into your asking that ear be modified to essentially adopt some what to me look like more triplet stuff, and if I'm misinterpreting ear is not a neat profile, but it's uh, uh, more of just kind of a data structure thing, then my then my question doesn't apply. But if ear is is an eat profile saying this is what the relying party specifically sees, then my question is why does the relying party have to see the triplet complication? So I may just misunderstand what ear is. Yeah, it is, it is an eat profile, right? So that that that's for sure. It is an eat profile. It is yes. 
And and okay. another perspective I wanted to give you on on this and why we went for the um, jot serialization for you know, among the other you know options that we had to, to serialize the, the the accepted claim set is because we look at the at, at the reliant party especially right so, and, and and look at what the tooling the existing tooling was apart from the complexity that you know as Ned says there's no free lunch, free lunch but we're looking at the thing from from the point of view of the airline party and saying okay what what do you have today right and and the thing that was you know sort sort of uh, omnipresent was the was the rigo based policy so the AP, the opa thing and in fact using uh, the opa primitives you can just you do the signature verification in a one liner you call io jot verify es256 or whatever you have you input the token and that's that's it and uh, and you could do the decoding in another line, and you can do the assertions on each of the uh, claims in the claim set that you've passed down in in another, you know three four five six lines. Right? So in ten lines of code maximum, the line party can by using existing tooling do the uh, verification, complete verification of any AR, and you know take the decision, the policy decision based on that. I will so, also say, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, let let me just sort of inject the customer perspective on this. Um, you're going to have vastly more relying party than you're going to have a, a, a testers, like vastly more, and uh, you're going to have the inputs to the tester change frequently as uh, your firmware updates are deployed. Etc. And I would venture to say that you know, sure, it, it would be good in the standard to allow flexibility to split the knowledge of you know where we evaluate what what claim, what measurement. Um, that would be great. But I also believe that for the vast majority of scenarios, what you want to do is when uh, you upgrade your firmware. You do not want to chase every like party and uh, have them change their uh, assessment. It's not going to be deployable, and as a result, it's not going to get used. So, uh, generally speaking, it's not really a question of do we encode, you know, from one format to another, from quorum to eat or whatever. That's not the the, the issue. The issue is that you want to. Uh, have a actually a mapping and it's not a reversible mapping from the you know many many measurements and relationships that you get uh, from you know examining the boot sequence of an event or like or a device or like whatever it is you got on the left hand side to a very small number of very succinct uh, determinations that are usually around things like uh, you know th this is you know the firmware is under two weeks old uh, which really means that, or sort of the latest update uh, took place, uh, you know, less than two weeks ago, uh, or there is no, nothing older, like nothing older than two weeks out of date or whatever. But that becomes, uh, this matches our policy for accessing, uh, accessing highly confidential data. And then what happens <clears throat> is uh, you change the policy for, that may, for what it means to access highly confidential data. That's the verifier's job. And then you're relying parties which may be deployed in the field, may not even be easy to change. Um, you know, uh, you you really want to shield them as much as possible from flux. <clears throat> so, so I think it's fair to say that the policy, the relying party policy is also doing something like a stage four or a stage six, where it's saying based on my the condition that's defined by my policy, it needs to match the ACS and then and then as a result, I want to assert whatever, you know, that it's good or bad or it's, you know, so push a as zero far and a hundred or whatever. Push as far down the, uh, uh, you know, the stage uh, as you can. If you can do stage six, that would be perfect. Uh, the reason you might want to go a little higher in the stack is if you're doing federation. Right. So your verifier yeah. is trying to basically, you know, say maybe some the intermediate processing so that when we federate with another organization, you know, we maybe have a richer set. But again, your relying party is really hard to manage. It could be an ATM. It could be only connecting uh, to the mothership, you know, like in right, right. for policy <clears throat> management. That could be any number of things could be offline when, when your policy changes. Right. So so the, what that what you're saying is that because of the the time frame in which things are allowed to change 
that there's constraints on on you know yes. how often change can the happen. The further left you happen, the more often the change is going to happen. The further right you go, the less frequent. Yeah. So so it's so it's there's a set of there's some each claim is going to have some property which is its useful lifetime. And I just want to decouple that from a claim that that sort of abstracts away an answer like trusted or not trusted versus um i need to know what i care about the that it's this svn for this root of trust that matters to me right the, yes you're gonna the, have a collection the rate of, of the rate it change is different for 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 those right uh correct correct that you will have different rates of change so but uh, like the reliance parties policy is usually a business logic so it may say yeah. uh like cleared for cl highly classified data it may think something like you know satisfies our gdpr requirements it may say located in this uh, you know this set of jurisdictions which is actually is a set it could be both in germany and uh in uh, europe uh right uh, and uh, it's, um, you know, yes, yeah, so they are individual claims and the policy on the relying party is not going to be, you know, whether the verifier said it's trusted or not, it's never going to be that, yeah. but it's going to be a logical, like, you should be able to write the relying party claim in Rego, right? Yeah. And, or, or, yeah. or, or, or something very, very like simple and, and, but, what I, like business yeah. but the point, well, my point is, is that there's a, there's an implied stage seven, which is the relying party policy. But like stage four and stage six, it needs to have a condition that matches the ACS. What is ACS again? Accepted claim set. It, it, it depends upon, I think that's the crux of what we're discussing here. What is the yeah. model by which the, the relying party gets the, the information to make its decision? Is it this yeah. lower, from my perspective, this lower level, you know, ACS that you're talking about with this graph, you know, all this, you know, it, 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 the triplets and so on, or is it the flat, simple EAT model of, you know, a flat or, a array of, yeah. of claims that are simplified? To I would be astounded if anything that is in the quote in terms of measurements, like your firmwares, your configuration, debuggable or not or whatever, if anything there uh, reaches the reliant party, and I actually mean it quite, quite seriously. So, for instance, the verifier might take a look at the IP address from which the, uh, you know, request came and Im impute the or the whatever the network segment from which it came uh, and impute location and then the location is not something the device even asserts but it's something that might leave your verifier for like downstream processing so uh, this is why i think if you're even looking at acs and you mean acs as in something that uh you know claims that pass through verifier but maybe grant a stamp of approval uh I, again, I don't. I don't want to sound too critical, but it would be like uh, solving the wrong problem from the point of view of the relying party. So, so I, I mean, I think I, I, I think maybe you're misinterpreting a little bit, in the sense that that after stage six, the verifier is going to have assertions that are kind of that top level, high level representation. If you, if that's what the relying party wants. <clears throat> and and matching the ACS doesn't mean you have to match everything in the ACS, but you have to match something in the ACS, even you know sort of post stage six where the verifier has, has said something. You know the the relying party has to be able to 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 assert the criteria that's important to it, and it has to be something that's represented in the ACS uh, before you can then. Well, it may Given be the that answer that he missing, wants, you know. Then maybe what's missing in this architecture is some equivalent of a like a security token service that does claims mapping. So maybe mm -hmm. the job of the verifier is simply validate the quote and simply say, yes, I have verified that the, all the claims made by the tester are, you know, backed by evidence without making like any decisions on you know whether we like this version of the firmware whether we like that it's debuggable like that basically nothing right nothing there yes. but then so in the middle like... not the relying party wants to see none of this i guarantee it sure. so sure. in the middle you can have an sts that says okay you know i have a set of sexually issue issues policy thing like you know the, 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 i can say if these sets of conditions are met i will say you map you you you, you satisfy my policy for x 
and that has nothing to do with firmware versions. Yeah. So you're saying, hey, the relying yeah. party doesn't want to do it, but the verifier can do it on behalf of the relying party, or you could have an intermediary that does it on behalf yeah. of the relying party. The relying party, party never. Like, I, I mean, I, I cannot imagine uh, a situation, certainly in the business hey. context, maybe if you're hey. building an airplane. Hey, Mark, Mark, and, and Ed, excuse me for interrupting, but we're we're out of time. So uh, okay. um, time, uh, time flies. Yeah, yeah man, I, I really appreciate the presentation. It was really... Um, Really, really helped me understand a lot more. And and thanks everybody for for participating. Um, uh, Dan, sorry we didn't get to the the other topic today, so that'll have to come next time. Um, so from a um, coordination perspective, a um, couple of questions. One is when do we want to have the next meeting? Um, I know I personally will not be here for the next um, two. I'll be out on on holiday for the um, 20, uh, for the 19th of December and the 2nd of January. Um, do we want to, what's the group want to do? We want to have uh, skip one or two meetings or, or, or what? Uh, I know I'm out the same dates. Okay. I, I'm out for the uh, first one, but the second one, I, I'll be here. All right. Do we have quorum for January 2nd? Do folks want to have January 2nd, Thomas or? Not Keith, the or... second, but on the 19th, no, not, but on the 19th, yes. Okay, you're there on the 19th, not on the 2nd. Um, I'll, it, it sounds to me like, sounds to me like there's little, most people will not be on the 19th and uh, a, a chunk won't be on the 2nd. So do we just want to say, we want to try the 2nd or do we want to hold off until the 16th of January? I would go with the 16th. All right, so unless I have, otherwise I'm gonna put on the notes that the 16th of January is the next meeting. Do we have um, uh, a volunteer to chair? I, I could do that, but uh, I don't know if anyone else wants to. I can, okay. I can do it. All right, Jim, you're the chair. And uh, from an agenda perspective, I think Ned has, oh, Ned is still here. Um, I suspect there might be uh, a few follow-up questions uh, on Coram. With um, so, if you're here, that'd be great. Um, okay. But uh, but we like really there was have... some that uh, could talk us about uh, talk to us about the Linux ABI for attestation. Yeah, so that we... was I saw that was marked, and we have Dan's topic about 2024 objectives. So. Um, Jim, I'll let you figure out uh, <laughs> what what you want to put into the the January sixteenth um, time slot and and ordering so on. Sure, yeah, I I can ask around about the Linux ABI. I mean, we do have some uh, internal Intel folks that could uh, present on that, so I could I could take that and see if anybody. Be I think there's to... already a a, a think... volunteer for Sam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jim, I confirm. I confirm that I can I can do the uh, Linux okay. ABI thing on sixteen. Oh, okay. okay. If there's a if there's enough time. Great. And we might also have Dan Williams come into the TAC meeting on I think it's December fourteenth on Thursday to uh, talk about that same topic. So I haven't confirmed with him yet though. Okay. Cool. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have, thank have, you. Have a, happy, happy holiday season. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.